Thank you. Thank you, Julia. It's very kind of you. Um, speaking of PAV, you're the only Canadian program that is accredited. <laughs> so I'm actually really thrilled to be here, uh, also for that reason, and because uh, um, it's just really nice to be at UBC. I've been to um, Vancouver, but never campus, so it's nice to be here. And thank you for coming. And uh, just really quickly, you know, um, I love to still being part of the research community, even though now I really don't get to do as much research as I want to. And uh, the nice thing about Columbia is I am still 25% faculty, so I still get to see my students. And so that's why I'm still directing the planning program. So uh, it's a little strange uh, arrangement, but at Columbia, a number of vice provosts are like that, which is actually kind of good. So, you know, Kelly, I was listening to you as administrator for hire. I'm like, <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. And to be able to uh, be connected with students and faculty is a real pleasure. So I thank you for coming today. And uh, as Julia has mentioned, I've been doing work on China for as long as I was in graduate school and then uh, teaching in planning for decades now. Um, have done some work elsewhere, but my anchor had always been in China. I use had because in the recent years, it's been much more challenging to do uh, field research in a way that I used to do. I am very much trained as a um, social scientist in a way. You know, uh, James would know I studied at Rutgers with uh, Susan and Anne Markison and Hu Xian and uh, Chester Rapkin. So we were very much uh, trained to be like, a little bit like sociologists, right? And, uh, and we really go out to the field and talk to people, do large scale surveys. And I also inherited a little bit uh, in a different stream of research from Anne Markison uh, by engaging in firm interviews which was actually my dissertation on special economic zones. And subsequently, I've done quite a bit of research on investment by both the public sector as well as foreign investors in the infrastructure sector. So my work um, has about three different prongs and very much all based uh, on field work and extensive of that in China. So I have not been able to do that in the last four years now, right? Since 2019. And uh, so I may be a little bit out of tune with what's going on in China. However, I do feel very fortunate. <laughs> so this today I wanted to present to you is a um, set of work I started to be engaged with uh, fall of 2019, we um, had a number of scholars invited them to, to Columbia to talk, to uh, try to put together this volume. So the motivation for this work was actually a colleague telling me, Weiping, you know, you've done so much work writing on migration, urbanization, infrastructure, but now you really want to look at how all of that has affected different corners of the Chinese society. And I was like, yeah, but I couldn't do it myself. And so that was the motivation. So this work is really multidisciplinary and really, uh, in terms of titling it urbanizing, is really look at the, the, the Chinese urbanization process as it's still moving, and, but trying to capture both the temporal, historical, and spatial complexities. Um, of that process in terms of both what underscores that process, but more importantly, what consequences result from that process. So this was our call. And, uh, we, you know, I fortunately for all these years, so this is also interesting. I love, you know, Julia, you know, we'll talk a little more and then some of you who work on Global South our scholarly identities tend to be straddling, at least if not two, maybe more uh, into uh, uh, disciplines or, or fields, right? Planning, we're all planners and planning scholars or maybe urban scholars, but I have been very 
uh, closely integrated with a very large network of China scholars. And, and that's how I met all of these um, people from other disciplines who look at Chinese cities or at least um, somewhat related to Chinese urbanism. And uh, it, it's a very fruitful uh, kinds of pursuit, although sometimes, you know, when I go to ACSP, I don't, I know Kelly or others could vouch for this. I always felt very marginalized, right? You know, how many people really work on China? Not that many. How many people even look on at Global South? It's also very limited. Planning, because it is so embedded in the local context and political and social construction, um, to be able to really study China by someone who's non-Chinese heritage is very challenging. I mean, Julia, I admire you. I would never be able to go to Germany and say I understand very much about that place. However, to just study China by Chinese heritage scholars is very limited and it's really important. So we go to history and political science fields, you have a lot more non-Chinese heritage scholars studying China. So that intersection is really important. And so I feel very fortunate to be able to do that. So our goal was to make this project a very much empirically grounded theorization project. And we asked three questions. We asked three questions, right? Uh, how has the process of urbanization been shaped and influenced by a number of factors? Uh, uh, and then subsequently the impacts. And then, um, but also uh, in the last five years to 10 years or so, Chinese economic growth has tapered down and, uh, but also other kinds of societal transitions are taking place and certainly in urban China, you're seeing that. And so we want to look at China from all its complexity, from all its, various positionings uh, and highlight those transitions and shifts. And quite actually serendipitously, we were looking at potentially some new sources of information for, conduct, for, conduct, for conducting research. Uh, at the time, it was still not COVID. However, uh, the political environment in China had been slowly but surely closing down. Right? And so we really wanted to look at that as well. I would not be able to say too much about that part, except maybe let me say a little bit now, um, the third purpose of the uh, book project. Um, so we've, there are about three or four chapters in the book that use non-conventional fieldwork based research like I had just described to you. Uh, one, of one, one of them, uh, uses, which I will present a little bit at the end of the talk, uses uh, satellite and remote sensing imagery, uh, basically through big data uh, kind of analytics to capture much more uh, fine-grained data also over a long period of time, right? So um, that's kind of uh, not new, new. Second was scraping this uh, commercial outfit called fang.com, F-A-N-G.com. Fang stands for housing in China. Uh, so to really scrape um, real estate transaction data through um, very fine grained. Um, and so that chapter, I think it's chapter three in the book that try to look at residential segregation or differentiation at, at a much finer grain level. Because for a very long time, decades, to study spatial segregation in Chinese cities was almost impossible. And the only kind of level of resolution was at um, sub-district level. So, so the whole city, just imagine Beijing, it's 21 million people and it's divided into about a dozen or so districts. So that's very, very large. Every district is 2 million people. And then the sub-districts is the next level. It's somewhat similar to census tract, but it's a little bigger. And so to study residential differentiation at that level of resolution is just not very good. So scraping the found data uh, allowed these scholars to look at it a little finer grained. Um, so 
two, all three scholars now are very much into big data analytical kinds of methods. One is Sarah Williams at MIT. The other is Wen Fei, um, uh, Xu Wenhui, Xu Wenfei at Cornell, and, and another scholar at NUS in Singapore. So, so they've been really doing this for a while. And then the th third type of uh, alternative data source that's been used is Google Image, uh, uh, Google Earth. So basically this was chapter two looking at um, Google Imageries over time because Google Imageries uh, update every month or so and this was about uh, efforts of by the municipal government in Beijing sweeping some quote unquote informal and illegal housing. So if you look at who got swept, then you look at different periods of time of Google Earth to really try to identify the extent to which people have been kicked out. And, and so that was also quite useful. And these two scholars, they're political scientists actually. They are not like the big data kind of people, but just looking at imageries allowed them to uh, uh, uncover some information that would not have been possible otherwise. So those, those kind of examples sort of address this question here. So today I really just want to focus, especially since we are all planners here and planning scholars and students, I want to really spend more time on the first aspect, which is the impact of urbanization as related to land and building form, but then also spend a little bit of time on the impact of urbanization on human conditions particularly in the context of demographic transition. And many of you probably are aware China is quite unique because of its past strict implementation of a government policy called the one child, one family. And so it, it is in this demographic transition much, much faster than most global South countries. You know, I was in India in the summer. It was just completely different, right? And so, it, and then so the human conditions and the impact on the human conditions is uh, felt more disproportionately by those who are older. Um, so I want to also talk a little bit about, about some of the transitions. So the reason we call it empirically grounded theorization is for many years, for many decades, people who work on China always say, okay, China is so different. We shouldn't compare it to anybody. Like, you know, uh, even John Friedman, you know, beloved John Friedman wrote his book, China in Transition, I believe, in 2005, right? It was actually a very well-read book, and I actually use it in my course on Chinese urbanism because, again, your non-Chinese heritage, but you look from outside, you actually sometimes see things a little more clearly. And so he, always, he also argued there are indigenous, in fact, he identified a set of four indigenous factors that were driving Chinese urbanization. Hence, so there is the so-called Chinese exceptionalism that, that, that we shouldn't be comparing China to anybody else, which is akin to, for many scholars, the quote-unquote American exceptionalism, right? You know, so in a sense. And, and it's also for those of you who work on Global South, it troubles me actually, it concerns me as well that the China also is never really considered part of global south. And so all of the, you know, especially from geography, you know, uh, theorizing from the south, China is not part of that conversation. So where is China, right? You know, so all of us felt that we need to uh, compel its positioning closer to the more, uh, central part of urban and planning research. But it is indeed true that um, when Susan Fancy and John Logan almost 20 years ago edited this book also on China, they essentially called China a hybrid model that you, who, 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 who do you compare China to, right? So I will try to do a little bit of that comparison today um, and really try to highlight our attempt to reposition research on China to more of a closer to center place in urban and uh, planning research. But we also wanted to think about ways that we can decenter perspectives that have allowed theories situated 
in particularly Western context uh, to be seen as universal. And so that is provincializing the West. Uh, I think there's really just one chapter in the book that focuses on that, a chapter 10. And it's particularly about um, smart city research. And because China has been leapfrogging to the more front of using bio identification and other kinds of digital technology, not just for security purposes, but really also for urban management and for data collection and for systematizing the collection of data through a digital infrastructure and network. I mean, I told the audience yesterday of one example, but I'm not gonna tell you a different example. So I was in Nanjing uh, shortly before COVID and we visited a very large tourism um, site. And then once we got to the parking lot, couldn't find our car. So all we need to do is go into the kiosk, typed in our uh, uh, um, you know, registration, uh, license plate. Immediately, we know where the car is. It's, everything has been scanned and it's <coughs> deal positioned. And I don't know where else you find that. And this was before COVID. And of course, we heard a lot about it during COVID. There was even more use of that. So not to say all of it is uh, pretty and rosy. Nonetheless, there's been huge investment in that. So we wanted to address that. And, and last but not least, as I mentioned already, to get away from framing China always as, oh, it's a planned you know, um, uh, uh, centrality. There's sort of huge the state is very instrumental, the state-society relationship is always quite uh, um, uh, you know, sort of showing a duality. And we really felt that there's a whole lot of ensemblage in between where market instruments and, and, and the centrality of state really get quite uh, embedded in each other at different levels and layers. And so we want to really create some new narratives and ideas to not only help us understand China better, but really to understand cities in general better. Okay, so that was, so all of us really try to do that in each of our chapters. And we, I think we kind of succeeded in some way because that we, you know, trying to publish an edited book with the university press is never easy. They, they're not interested. And so I had to really convince them. <coughs> and the reviewers were very, very happy to see that we had these uh, uh, large ideas you know, up front and to organize the chapters around these ideas. And then because we all met in 2019 in the fall, I was able to actually ask everybody to do some revision. My co-editor did certain chapters, so I did certain chapters. So we took a couple of years and, and we were able to pull it together. So we're very happy about that. So this essentially is what I was saying earlier, that uh, our goal was really to move China, obviously some of you work on India or Latin America, to really to more uh, uh, central positioning in the urban and <coughs> planning knowledge and theory uh, realm. So I don't know how much we succeeded, but I think um, we're trying. All right, so let me now get into a little bit of the details. That is um, looking at the impact of um, urbanization on a number of things, uh, particularly the built environment and human conditions. And this is just to say that we know if we look at countries across the world, there we can see that urbanization in terms of its process, so I don't have to define urban here now, you all study urban, so it is, it's a much uh, understanding audience. We do know that uh, if you look at the United States, you look at uh, the UK, you look at other places, uh, even in uh, other global south places, like Latin America, Latin America, Mexico, urbanization essentially would be taking off what industrialization kicks in, right? So uh, US late 1800s, UK late 1700s, uh, let's see Argentina uh, or Mexico a little bit later because of the, uh, the 
civil war, uh, but Argentina, you look at it, it's early 20th century, right? When uh, industrialization took like a small kick off. And the same then in China, they started more after 1979. And the slope is obviously steeper because of the condensed time period. However, we also notice in most other countries, the, the, the pickup of the pace of organization tends to begin to uh, taper off when the level of organization reaches about upper 70s and 80s. In fact, only small countries have levels of organization higher than 80. I mean, if you look at Canada and US, it's about 80, right? And uh, there are always people who choose to live in rural areas, which is distinguished by uh, the sort of predominance of agricultural activities and then uh, lower density in terms of population. So lots of people are asking if China now is undergoing slowing down, uh, would there still be a, a, a space for China to continue to urbanize? Now, so, you know, not long ago, around 1979, it was about 20% of Chinese population living in urban areas. Now it's a little over 60%. And then, so compared to the US, there's still about another 15% to 20% of growth, room for growth. So, uh, you know, in fact, especially the popular media, I get a lot of inquiries from journalists, you know, will we see kind of a dying of continuation of urbanization in China, I would always say, no, we're going to be able to see more either through migration or what we call in situ urbanization. And as you can see with China's uh, geography, its distribution of cities is actually very concentrated, very, very different from most other countries around the world. Mexico maybe is one of the exceptions and Thailand is another one. Uh, well, I would say Japan too, uh, but what happens is if we draw a line from here to top over there, imaginary line, 40% territory on this side, 60% territory on that side, 95% population on this side, 5% on the other side. And there's no doubt why you know, uh, that underscores the distribution of large cities in this sense. And just like anywhere else, right? Uh, most large cities historically have arrived uh, on the coast, right? So some of the biggest cities, and then or on rivers, right? So we're seeing uh, Chongqing, uh, Wuhan. So, so, so the historical urbanization patterns of China are very similar to many other. And that's why I always say to my students and my colleagues, I say China is actually not that unique in many ways, historically and even contemporarily. And uh, I will show you why that is the case. But that's not to say there are no unique uh, uh, features. So one of the unique <coughs> features is the following. So if you look at these two uh, curves, the top one is the growth of population in urban areas. I use this uh, y-axis. The bottom one is the growth of land areas in urban places and uses. This side of the axis, y-axis. Um, so from about 20% in 1978 to over 60% now by 2023. But you take notice, right? The curve or the, uh, the, 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 the slope of the lower curve is just higher. Um, and then to me, it's very counterintuitive. You know, someone else has said, why so? Um, well, so if you look at China, its territory land area is about the same as the United States and the population is about five times. You wouldn't think that as urbanization proceeds, It'll grow denser, right? Because urban areas is usually denser than rural areas. That's why I say it's counterintuitive. And it is indeed counterintuitive, right? And um, so one of the chapters in the book talks a little bit about this, but not exactly focusing on why the case. My own chapter, which is chapter one, actually talks about this. And so I want to spend a little bit more time on that because uh, it's very much my own work and also 
very much a planning question and an urban question for sure. So just to give you an example of a one established city um, whose name is Nanjing, it's not the biggest, it's also not a smaller one, it's now somewhere around 10 to 12 million in population, it's a capital of a province just north of Shanghai, and so it's like, like a state capital here. Any um, uh, provinces here or a state capital in the United States. And so in 20 years, you can see the physical footprint of the city has increased quite significantly, both in terms of the coverage, but also in terms of the leapfrogging patterns. It's very similar to urban sprawl. It really just is very similar to urban sprawl, right? For those of you who kind of have seen, like even in Portland, Oregon, it's kind of expensive with a, even with an urban growth boundary. And so it's no exception here. And then going more down to the ground where you are seeing is also the kind of development we see very autocentric kind of development. It's almost impossible to cross the street, right? Like that. And, the, and for a place that used to have so many bike lanes and so much sort of pedestrian oriented travel behavior now, it's very much a driving culture in many large cities in China. And essentially, uh, new types of neighborhoods are rising up like these. And these are called super blocks. Um, they contain anywhere between 10,000 to 16,000 people in one development. And you know, the, the, some of the monotony of uh, uh, architecture and design makes it very difficult to identify you know, which building you actually live in. And the reason of this kind of super blocks mushrooming has a lot to do is that uh, what we call the privatization of urban services. So this entire large super block is developed by one developer. So all of the streets in within, or the facilities and the amenities are all provided by the developer, not by the city. So in a sense, you have uh, privatized that. And what it also does is to create these bottlenecks in terms of egress and ingress, right? It, you know, exit and, and, and entry and creates quite a bit bottlenecks on uh, street networks uh, in, in the cities. And so these are not in downtown places in Chinese cities, often in the closed suburbs or even outer suburbs. But you would say, well, actually, density is not that bad, right? It's really not that bad. But I will show you a little bit, little bit that you will see density uh, is a little bit uh, uh, sort of deceiving in that sense. Um, the, so this one is actually somewhat closer to the downtown area, as you can see, this is sort of uh, Fudong. And then in Chinese cities, the central areas, you actually will see FAR, you know, flow area ratio, go up to about five, which is not bad, right? Uh, New York, Manhattan goes up to about eight, you know, uh, sometimes some places as low as 15. You look at Hong Kong, usually eight is very, very common, and then in the central area can go to 10 to 12. But you don't have to go very far to go down to two in Chinese cities. In fact, it's by planning this restriction of how high FARs can go in just outside central areas. So that's one reason that drives density down. And there's a huge concern about uh, higher density causing congestion and so on and so forth, which is all well, quote unquote, placed. Um, but uh, I think starting around the first decade of 2000 till now, everyone who focuses on Chinese urban, I guess, development patterns and real estate and so on have been urging Chinese planners about the sort of lower density than they should have been. And in fact, if you compare big cities like Shanghai and Beijing to Seoul or Hong Kong or Tokyo, FARs in Chinese cities are significantly lower. Um, another set of evidence confirms uh, the same 
pattern. So the World Bank and Asian Development Bank did a survey of some close to 900 cities in East Asia and the Pacific region. And what it looked at is um, whether urban population grows outpace land or the other way around. As you can see, most East Asian cities had density increase. Most Chinese cities had density decrease. Even some of them, 54 of them, uh, had population decline where urban land remains expanding. And this, these are very similar to the North American or even German, uh, Germany, the industrial uh, Rust Belt, right? You know, if you're losing manufacturing jobs or you're losing population, these in China are mostly in the Northeast. And the, uh, I don't, it's okay. Uh, you might not be able to see as well. And it's tricky to do comparison because some of these other cities in Japan and Malaysia and so on have, witnessed urban growth earlier than the Chinese cities, right? The Chinese cities is in the last 30 to 40 years, um, but Jakarta or Kuala Lumpur grew a little bit early, Seoul certainly even earlier. And now, so the stage of development, um, the stages of development are different by looking at this comparison. Nonetheless, what you're seeing is any map that shows a lot of red is spatial expansion of the land areas in cities, and you see a lot more of them in Chinese cities. So, what's driving this, right? What is driving this? So, so, so it just seems very counterintuitive and very resource intense, and it's not a sustainable way of urbanizing in a country where uh, agricultural land per capita is actually extremely low uh, because of the large size of the population. So I argue that the question of land is central to this uh, 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 pattern of development. So land in China, in, especially in urban China, rural China has a different land property rights regime. In urban China, land is owned by the state in theory, and it's leased out to uh, users or developers. I heard that this whole property to the state is sort of similar, uh, that there is, uh, I forgot what the word was used, but then uh, most of the folks who have housing units here only lease, right? You don't own. And um, so, and as a result, every time there's a lease transaction, there's income to cities. However, there's no uh, property taxes in China for residential pro uh, uh, properties. It's very similar to the system in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, Hong Kong al almost entirely is a leasehold system. Singapore is about 80%. So land uh, lease bec has become a significant source of revenue for local government. And then because there remain to be a number of actors in the urban economies in China that are not market-based, and so distribution of land or leasing of land has two tracks. One is market-based, one is assignment-based for state-owned enterprises. So that locked in also prevents some of the most efficient use of Right, if you stay enterprise, you might get very nice piece of land in right in the middle of the city at, at very low density. Um, and then, of course, land can also be used as a collateral to guarantee to banks when developers want to get loans to develop new residential areas and others based on the potential uh, 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 revenue that could be generated from land in the future. So land isn't just by leasing you get income, it also becomes collateral. It's sort of what Fulong Wu would call financialization. And then as a result, the urban form reflects this all in the process. So you see a lot of super forms that I just showed you earlier. And so very quickly you can see if we compare China uh, to United States as the two ends of a spectrum. 
China is on the opposite side of the United States in that it's all entirely leasehold in urban areas. In the US, it's almost entirely freehold, with exception maybe a few places, you know, uh, Hawaii being one of them where you have very large landholders who kind of lease out land. But still, these landholders are primarily private. And in between, Netherlands is partially leasehold, and then Britain, until um, three or so decades ago, nationalized development rights. So you might own land privately, but you can't really easily, you couldn't easily develop. So this kind of um, comparison helps us to understand why in China, sometimes development is so easy, you know, for a special uh, economic zone, and acquiring of land is so quickly because you don't have to convince every landowner to sell your land. Mm -hmm. India, I heard that you know, it takes forever, and the landowner could say, "Don't want to sell," right? But in China, it's a lot different. But that's not to say there's no protest. There's a lot of protest by rural land uh, users. So essentially, this is sort of in my chapter. I argue that local governments use land as a significant resource to support other types of municipal um, spending. Uh, infrastructure uh, being included here, but also other kinds of programs like social programs. But local government is not directly involved in transactions in land. They are usually done by these quasi um, public or we call public corporations and they are called urban development financing corporations or in theory they're called local government financing vehicles and so these are quasi or maybe like port authority in New York or economic development corporations in other places that they have to watch their bottom line so they use they get loans from banks by using future land revenues as collateral, but they also, uh, so there's quite a bit of what we call the wealth generating, uh, wealth generating uh, um, financial products or uh, project bonds to get uh, basically financing from the public. So this is sort of on the financing set involved by these LGFP. On the land side, government using eminent domain is able to get rural land converted to urban and then subsequently lease out to developers to uh, engage in the kind of development I just showed you in the super blocks. So then the government essentially allow these LGFDs to use the land at almost no cost or very low. This is the same way in Hong Kong, how the metro uh, system is, is, is developed. And in fact, uh, Hong Kong's metro system is the only profiting metro system in the world for a long time. Not because the metro is very efficient, it is because the government allows the Hong Kong MTR uh, Corporation to use land around stations for leasing to commercial use to create a whole lot of revenues to then cross-subsidize metro operation. Same in Japan, JAR, the Japan Air, uh, 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 Railway uh, Company does very much similar, even though it's private. So this is not new, right? But China does it in a massive scale. And lots of African countries are looking to China as examples because, uh, especially those who had the socialist legacy, because land was also probably owned, and so in the Chinese word um, expression, this is called pan huo, because land is really real estate, it's not mobile, but you could get value out of it. Uh, and, but this can be very problematic. I mean, in fact, uh, we argue, myself and other scholars really argue that this provides a perverse incentive for local governments to continue to want to lease out more land because there's you know, revenue sources to fund uh, local initiatives because there is indeed a what we call un, uh, unfulfilled mandate 
um, by so local governments uh, are sort of in need of these kinds of revenues. Right. So, but this also shows that Chinese cities fund the infrastructure in very different ways uh, from many other countries, especially global south countries. So I just recently concluded a paper on uh, infrastructure financing sort of in a comparative fashion, and China continues to stand out, not only by the fact that it, it's mostly through um, debt financing, meaning borrowing, instead of uh, what we call in the uh, most Western countries through either local taxes or from borrowing from capital markets, right, by uh, municipal bonds. Uh, but in China, it's mostly borrowing. And then, of course, land lease and transfer as a big part of the financing. So this, all of which, so I think this land, the, the, the reliance on land financing or even land financialization is probably the key reason, the direct reason for this type of lower density and sprawling development that we are seeing in Chinese cities. There are other reasons. The root reason is the tax system or the central local fiscal relations, but I'm not gonna go into that. So other uh, manifestation of this has to do also, now you see in terms of street network density, Chinese cities are actually lower, of course, um, you know, um, Vancouver is included in here. Uh, this is all at scale. So this makes it a lot harder now to walk in Chinese cities. It's as simple as that. And there are some numbers here looking at comparable cities in, uh, of comparable sizes uh, to Chinese cities and in terms of street net, network density, right? Uh, and the measurement is how many kilometers mm -hmm. in a, a square kilometer area. But this doesn't speak about the the the, so the width, the, 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 the you know what do you call it? Uh, uh, I'm blanking on the word, right? So it's side to side, um, right away. How far it is? This doesn't measure that. So street still takes up quite a large percentage of urban land, but in terms of street length, then it's a lot harder to walk, right? Both ways ag uh, 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 aggravates the walking on pedestrian types of mobility. So uh, that comparison is pretty stark. So last, let me just say a little bit about the impact on human conditions, and then uh, the, the two trans types of transitions we're overseeing. And uh, again, I have good data mostly only on two big cities, because uh, 2020 census has not been made widely available at a finer grain level. But you can see, what you can see here is that the percentage of population in the largest cities that are um, migrants have just skyrocketed in the last uh, 30 years. And the migrants were not counted uh, as part of urban population until about 2000, the census. So now in the two largest cities, migrants make up about 40% of the population. The reason for that is the uh, growth of manufacturing industry, the growth of um, informal sector, not informal in a sense like um, sort of trying to make a living, but rather unregulated kinds of economic uh, activities, uh, you know, street vendoring, domestic health, um, healthcare, aids and so on and so forth that have not really worked into more formalized labor market practices. And it's very much sort of individual based. And so one of my colleagues really in this chapter five shows that if we look at all of the populations now that are counted in Chinese cities, overall urbanization has brought out very positive consequence. That is, if we look at absolute poverty, that it has decreased across the board, no matter what standard measurement you use, over time. It's just gotten better. People are living a higher uh, level of conditions. 
However, if you look at uh, relative poverty, no matter what standard and measurement you use, it's shown very much uh, increasing inequality. So then again, the Chinese cities are not really that different from other cities. Around the early 1980s, Chinese cities and the countryside were probably the most equal in its own history as well as across around the world. But since then, Chinese cities have become more westernized, quote unquote, because we could see from the physical form, yes, also in terms of human condition as well. That is, uh, the better are getting better off, the worse are getting worse off. And that is uh, a very troubling uh, development. On the other hand, what, yeah, I know, don't worry about it. You can't see, I'll explain it. When migrants first started to come to cities, and I did about 15 to 20 years of work on migration and really talked to a lot of migrants in the late 90s and early 2000s, and many of them were very bitter because they were really treated like undocumented immigrants in this country which I actually did write some about how they are so similar because they had very limited access to urban amenities and types of jobs that are more desirable, all sorts of things. But in recent two decades, uh, these two economists have done some work by using two different types of data, mostly to the household uh, income surveys in China, and they have discovered that no matter which database they use and which two slightly different time periods they use, one from 2002 to 2013, the other from uh, 2010 to 2014, and there is clear evidence that the wage rates of migrant workers are getting closer to local workers is actually probably a good development. So again, so this urbanization process in China is not uniformly one direction or the other direction. It's becoming much more complex and it also includes uh, groups that benefit more than others and then development that are counter progress than other types of development. In terms of human condition, last but not least, are those people who are left behind. And so in the early days when we look at uh, urbanization, we mostly look at return migration, whether migrants who've been to cities have brought some benefits to the countryside. Now there's a new research, especially in the chapter seven by Professor Xin from China, looking at how people who stayed behind were affected by migration and urbanization. And what they're looking at is this particular group, as I mentioned very early on, China is getting older before it really gets richer, and is are the older people, age 60 and above. So what they're looking at are about 150,000 people reported in 2015 that were essentially gone, missing, cannot be found anymore. Um, and what they are really trying to prove is that Regions and areas that are sending more migrants out. So what you can see is here, the outflow regions. The inflow regions are the receiving of migrant regions. And the stagnant is very little, is there, very little mobility. And so they went to 21 counties in these three different regions. The top uh, table is just geographical regions, but the uh, bottom one is more useful to show that in terms of migration, net migration, those areas with a lot more outflows are seeing more older people disappearing. And this has a lot to do with rural areas in China have traditionally relied on family care as an old age care. And so uh, urbanization has also had this impact on those who are left behind. So last, I want to just spend a few minutes on these two types of transition. And this one uh, is a little bit uh, more complicated by an uh, environmental health scholar from Berkeley. And so Justin really looked at it in terms of public health cost. And I'm not going to explain too much of the graph. The main argument he made is that if urbanization is far more uh, chaotic and 
very fast in pace, the more vulnerable populations and their health conditions and uh, human conditions uh, will reach a comparable level much later than if, so this curve, much later than if it was sort of more equal way of growth and also more coordinated and planned way of urbanization. And, you know, we also know urbanization brings improvement in some aspects, right? You build more infrastructure, you treat more sewage, and overall health conditions improve. But on the other hand, air pollution, water pollution increases with industrialization that brings negative effects. And the poor, the migrants, <coughs> and sometimes the elderly tend to be the most vulnerable to the negative sides of impact. What he wants to argue even more timely is the effect of climate change. Essentially, with climate change, in an analogy, he argues that some of the progress is made by Chinese cities will be literally eaten away because of climate change, because the cost that is involved in dealing with sea level rise, dealing with flooding, and dealing with exposure by the more marginal and uh, vulnerable groups. So he's arguing that urbanization and development are not necessarily linearly associated with improvement in environmental health and public health. And, and hence, um, calling for more research to look at in China how different groups of urban populations uh, are uh, affected by this very rapid pace of urbanization. Last is an environmental planner, uh, Pele Fan, who now at, uh, at uh, Tufts now, uh, where I used to be. And she used uh, uh, remote sensing imagery, particularly NASA remote sensing imagery and satellite imagery to really track back all the way to 1997 and then uh, to current decade and large number of cities, about nine of these, to look at how urbanization has brought about different types of pollution at different levels. And so if you look at uh, NO2 here, um, uh, nitrogen oxide uh, dioxide, Shanghai is bad, right? It's just bad. Um, it's on top, um, but it has fluctuated. But some other cities are not doing that bad. Um, and then if we look at uh, PM 2.5, the, you know, the suspension of particulate in the air in the afternoon and so on and so forth. Shanghai is not that bad, right? Um, yeah, it dropped down here. And then at the top uh, is actually Beijing. And we all know Beijing's air uh, is much more representing of a kind of air that LA used to see the smog kind of thing. So her argument is really now Chinese cities are undergoing environmental transition. Some of them, because of high levels of industrialization or motorization, are much more like global north cities with very large environmental footprint and pollution levels, although still differ uh, in terms of different pollutants. Then there are other Chinese cities, things, uh, places like Fukuhaoke or Lanzhou or Ulumichi, and that are far less industrialized and really are remaining to be more like global sub cities with limited environmental footprint and consequences for its surrounding regions. So, so with that, I want to just to say that our work essentially ha uh, has kind of given us some insight into this very uh, now differentiated process of urbanization, or what we call urbanizing. And so spatially in different regions and different areas and then temporally different times that we see these uh, uh, differentiating patterns but also different populations are affected very differently. And so we, um, we were uh, quite, um, I guess I was happy that we were able to do this 
And this is actually in Steve Wuhan, when we were all kind of, after we met and we all were writing our chapters and where we could meet again and to see like, you know, you still see Chinese city crowded in terms of how many people on the streets, right? Um, on the other hand, the, the, the more aggregate evidence suggests there is you know, a different pattern of development happening that may be beyond the superficial. 